In a world where horrid stenches and piercing screams come not from the realms of fantasy, but from the nightmare of reality. Come two heroes bonded by love and the kind of desperation only parents can know. No, God, please, no, no, no! Behold, RPGs and Baby Makes Three, the greatest podcast in the history of all podcasts by parents who have made a podcast about being gamers with a baby. Did I mention it's a podcast? Here are your hosts, Gretchen Hilmers and Rob Hessler. Episode 8 of RPGs and Baby Makes 3. I'm Rob Hessler. I am Gretchen Hilmers. We're the hosts. Are we? I mean, as far as I know, although um, I haven't been sleeping a lot lately, so it's really hard to tell. <laughs> I don't right really now. know what's going on anymore. All I just you, do. <laughs> all of you out there, you know, when you that have kids, if you're if you're uh, one of the people who who has kids that listens, then you know that sometimes your kid has a developmental leap and they just don't sleep anymore for a little while. <laughs> so so Rob was up at four o'clock in the morning. Uh, making, finishing off his, uh, halfling, were they? Kender Kiffles. Kender Kiffles from, for the cooking episode. <laughs> yeah, for the upcoming cooking episode. So I made Kender Kiffles in the middle of the night. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, you gotta be productive at those times. Let me tell you, if you want to be involved in gaming, you got to work for it when you're a parent. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, this is episode eight. Thank you for tuning in. We really appreciate it. And um, we've got a great episode lined up for you, a couple of segments. And of course, we're going to go through our week in gaming. But we're going to start here with a a bit of a, well, this isn't a, an email, but this is a comment that we got on our YouTube posting of a recent episode. I believe this was for episode five. Okay, so yeah, this is for episode five. And this is Dark Trent 182. And Dark Trent posts quite a bit of comments, so we're just going to go ahead and read these and maybe we'll respond as we go along. She says, One, notes can also be taken in character. If you're playing a dumb character, you could just write down only what your character knows. Useful for figuring out what people learned while the party was split up. Two, each table needs to talk about their commitment to character versus the table's fun. Some tables have fun being so dedicated to being in character that that is where they find their fun. It's when two opposing philosophies come into conflict that there can be a lot of hard feelings. And then three, she says, some people are very visual. Some people are able to hear something and be able to mentally translate that into a map. I think part of the reason that Pathfinder Society uses maps is so that people get an objective view of what's happening. It also stops rules lawyers and cheaters from saying, nah-uh, that's not what you said, as well as making sure that everyone can understand what's happening in the scene because they got distracted. Let's say the game is at a parent's house and the baby is having trouble going to sleep. Being able to glance at the table and see the situation helps reorient the parent and, ah, acid arrow to the lead troll and the baby starts crying again. It can be metagaming because the players get a top-down view, but if you hear a description and can't grok it, visuals help. So here, the... I, I, I like this rules lawyer. I know. <laughs> Have you never heard the term rules lawyer before? No. Oh my gosh, Gretchen, you are like a, a, a newborn baby out into the sun for the first time, staggering, like toddling like a toddler, like you've just come... Well then, I'm not a newborn baby. Okay, you're a toddler then. You're toddling out into the sun and you're like, everything is new! <laughs> <laughs> so this episode, episode uh, five, was <laughs> taking notes, the library D&D program, and metagaming. So let's go kind of point by point here. So number one, she's talking about taking notes in character. Love that. I like that idea too. I think that that's a really great idea in trying to remember what specifically your character is doing. Now, we were recently playing a short three-part fate game um about a sort of sci-fi 
to the faintest star was I mean, the name of it. it wasn't sort of sci-fi. It was sci-fi. Sci-fi. So I was playing my character, Ted Robinson, and I did take notes in the game from his perspective specifically. So when I did corporate the... Corporate re- yes man. Yeah, corporate yes man, and which was really actually kind of fun. But he was deceiving everybody, which I thought was really fun there. Yeah. But yeah, so I took notes in his character. And then when I write journals for my characters, I always write them in their oh, yeah. character perspective. And I don't really do super well with taking detailed notes like our recent guest Bianca does, for example. I'm terrible at notes. I get into the character and I'm just concentrating on trying to play my character and like not screw it up a lot of the times that like I kind of forget to like write stuff down. And then I'll have like this piece of paper that has like four names like in various places and it'll, (laughs) it'll say like horse somewhere. And I'm like, what does this even mean? Like, it doesn't even make any sense. You know, what I like doing is, you know, you always ask for a recap of the previous game. I think a lot of DMs do that and GMs do that. But I like doing it from the perspective of my character. <laughs> it's tick, pretty tick. funny. <laughs> uh, tick, tick, Bramblebing, the Kender Bard. And it is just kind of fun. It's a great way to get me into character starting off real quick. And the kind of funny thing is, it's just like a Kender. I don't remember all the details of what happened in a game. I just remember the shiny bits. And uh, it fits perfectly. Just yeah, you just start. Character. You just start talking faster and faster and faster, <laughs> and like food starts coming up, and basically you start lamenting how nobody respected the fact that you did everything. <laughs> it's great. It's really funny. That's a really good way to do it. Uh, point number two, she talks about the talk about the commitment to the characters, ta- the commitment to the character versus the tables fun. I thought this was a really good point that she made. She says it's when two opposing philosophies come into conflict that there could be a hard feeling. So some. Game tables want to be, I'm just playing my character. They want to go fully in character, even if that means table conflict. And as long as that is the case at the table and everybody agrees to it, that is okay, actually. And we didn't really address that. We kind of undervalued that. We sort of made it. That's true. Yeah, we were like, oh, you got to adjust to be... To be what the fun is for everybody else. But perhaps if if that's your game that you're playing in, then that's perfectly fine, too. Yeah. But if you're the odd person out and everyone wants to have fun uh out of character as well as in character and you want to be in character you kind of have to be a little uh flexible yeah you either adapt or you need to find a different game essentially it's kind of you got to go with the tone read the room adapter you're out read the room read the room dude (laughs) and then the first thing last thing that she talks about is using the maps we this was about our metagaming thing we were sort of talking about that but I'm not, let's not really answer that right now because we're going to do a segment in a future episode upcoming about theater of the mind versus battle maps. And we're going to bring Amanda Plegman back in from Pathfinder Society who loves using the battle maps to come from that perspective. And I'm a big theater of the mind guy. So we're going to kind of have a good discussion about that, the pros and cons of each approach. And so we'll talk about that in a future episode. But thanks, Dark Trent, for, for you know commenting on the YouTube page. And you can all comment there on, on YouTube. Um, we filter them, so if you're not nice, then we'll delete them. Uh, I got some spam comments that were like, hey, you could hook up with me if you click on this link. That. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, deleted a couple of those but of course you can also email us at rpgs and baby makes three at gmail.com and we would love to read your emails and talk about your uh whatever you've got going on responses to the previous episodes or just some things that you want to bring up and you'd like us to talk about so anyway let's roll for initiative they see me rolling some people are born lucky let's roll roll for initiative. All right, let's talk about our week in gaming, Gretch, because it's been a really good two weeks since our last episode. We've had some, well, we've had a lot of really interesting games happening, including the first time we've played a GM list game, you and I, Alice is Missing. Yeah, wow. What an incredible game. An emotional roller coaster. <laughs> Sweet. Glory. So, if you don't know what this game is, and we didn't really, inst- actually, it's almost hard to know what this game is beforehand. But essentially, it's a game that you play via text messages. It's a silent game. You don't actually talk to each other during the game. There's a group text message, and then you text 
the other characters in the group. This is perfect for online play. Perfect, fantastic for online play. Perfectly oriented for online play. And the theme is, is that a woman named Alice goes missing. And you are all characters that relate to her in one way or another. What did you play? I played Julia North, her secret girlfriend. I can't remember what my character's name was, but I played the secret crush. Evan? That might be right. And I was playing a, a character who was like a, um, a jock football star. And Alice was not particularly popular, but she was friends with like one of the popular girls at school. So but that's how... this information is only written by the group of players at the beginning of the game. Right. So it could be anything. So there was a, there's a period at the beginning of the game where everybody kind of writes your connections, writes you write your stories about your characters, and that you do live. You do that as like a, a spoken together kind of conversation. And then the game starts, and for this online version, it was an audio background, basically. It's a 90-minute game. There's literally a countdown on it. On YouTube. On YouTube. Which there's... has amazing music. Such great oh atmospheric music. Makes you, you feel... You have to look it up, even if you're just going to jam out to it, which there isn't jamming. You'll probably just... Sad out get, to it. Get a little sad. <laughs> yeah. But, um, and then... Contemplative. Con- con- contemplative? Contemplative. Contemplative. Let's you're, think you're about gonna, that one. You're going to edit that one out, right? Then, well, I don't know. We'll, I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. Who knows how to pronounce <laughs> words? I don't know words. <laughs> so you, you create the characters. You make some basic ideas about potential suspects in the disappearance of Alice and potential locations that will play a role during the game. And then there's a randomizer that throws out cards to players during the game that gives you bits of information. And you communicate to each other but based on those pieces of information. you don't necessarily know what anyone else has. It's right. sent to you secretly through yeah. the bot. So each person gets different pieces of information or different details or and you can reveal them. Every character also has a, a kind of like a dark secret that they reveal during yeah. the, during the game. Which is a secret you come up with. This is probably sounding crazy to you if you're listening to this right now. Like, it's really difficult to sort of fully explain it, but I don't know if I've ever felt more immersive in a game than I've played before. I started genuinely freaking out. I was getting super stressed about it because you're so in character and there's messages flying all over the place and the music is super atmospheric. And, oh, and we didn't even talk about at the very beginning, you record your last voicemail to Alice based on your character and then after the game is over the timer goes off the voicemails are all played you listen to all of the voicemails in a row and you kind of it kind of fills in some of the blanks about the characters but it's hard to sort of express what the game is but because everybody is communicating and you're having this back and forth and these cards are coming out like every 10 minutes or so it felt like I was in it Mm-hmm. I was in the game. Yeah. And very immersive. And it gets kind of weird sitting right next to you and not talking to you. We were just so deep into the the play. It was it was weird. I mean I've never you know, even when we played Ten Candles, like I was still, you know, when we were muted, kind of, you know, munching on snacks, joking around, doing, you know, whatever I do. Not this time. No, this time. No, we no just... but there were some snacks at the beginning. There were. That was at the very beginning. Yeah. That's I true. don't think I could have handled eating snacks in the <laughs> game. I would have been like too nauseous. <laughs> I and don't too upset. feel good. But that was a great game. And actually, you know, you just mentioned 10 Candles. I don't, I think we've played 10 Candles since the last time we recorded a yeah. podcast. Yeah. So that's another amazing game we played. Well, first of all, let's just tie off the loose ends of Alice is Missing. Amazing. Very highly recommend that game. Very recommend, yeah. Last episode, we talked about getting back into gaming after a layoff. We talked about Discord servers. It's a perfect game to play via Discord. It was so well... Like, mm-hmm. it's the kind of thing that I don't think a live table would really be good for, actually. So... Now, I will admit, I was a little overwhelmed at first at all the different chat pages. But as soon as you started moving, the notifications were popping up, it got really easy to figure out what was going on. Exactly. And the the person who was running the game had run it like tons of times before, and he did a really great job. Yeah, he was great. It's GMless, though, so he was hosting the game. He actually played in the game with us mm-hmm. because it, the, it's all randomized, like what gets sent out. So, like, once the game gets rolling, 
you don't need somebody to orient the game for you. You yeah. just he, he could play. So we all played, and he was great. That guy was uh, his name is Morgan. He was a really he did a great job running the game, and we had a lot of fun with that. Yeah. But check that one out. And then Ten Candles. I don't know if you are all familiar with this, but we can explain what that's all about. So basically, uh, as you're playing, certain things start happening in the scenario, and you have. When it's played live, you literally have 10 candles that are lit in front of you. And as these things happen, one candle gets put out each uh, incrementally until it's, you know, pitch black um, at the end. But you die. Your character will die. And it's, of course, very bleak. Uh, in our scenario, we woke up or we were all on a ship, a pirate ship, or some ship, and we were all kidnapped, and then it was getting out of said ship. And uh, basically, when it came down to it, I, I believe uh, our Lord Cthulhu... Uh, <laughs> it was essentially some sort of old one tentacle monster. Yeah, it just uh, <laughs> ended up murdering all of them. Yeah, so there's ten candles you light at the beginning of the game, and every time, as Gretchen was saying, they incrementally go out. But it's it's not random... It's when you fail at something. One of them gets blown out. If if you fail, and you can sort of, it, essentially you have a dice pool that relates to the number of candles that you have. And the, the game master, the person running the game, has a dice pool. And their dice pool is ever increasing as yours is decreasing. So yeah. things become harder and harder and more frantic. And you have certain aspects about your character that you can play, essentially, for the dice re-rolls and bonuses and things like that. All of our characters were, like, super flawed. Like, they were all very flawed characters. Yeah, but you gave each other flaws. We each gave each other so, flaws, So, you yeah. know, I played a character who I decided was a prim school teacher, but someone gave me the flaw of I let someone die whom I could have prevented their death, but they annoyed me. So I didn't prevent their death. Yeah, and my my that's so Damn. funny. I gave you that actually. Did you? Yeah, oh I was the one God. who gave you that. I my flaw was so my character was like this. He was <laughs> a merchant of the seas, and he was very obnoxious. His life quest was to sample all of like the delicious foods and beverages and like everything that the world had to offer. And it was like set so in, like kind this, of like you. Yeah, <laughs> it was set in the seventeen hundreds. <laughs> but his his secret was that he had been stealing food. And hoarding it from the rest of the group, and like as you were all captives, so like everybody's starving, and like he's still hoarding and eating the food. So like the whole I don't time, know if that ever came out. I don't know if it did either. <laughs> <laughs> but of course, we all like went slowly mad as the game was going on, and then the candles got blown out. We were playing online, but. Gretchen and I, of course, were both in the game. We were here at home, so I lit up a bunch of LED candles. Rob was very... I mean, okay, so we wanted to go with LED candles, but we had to mix because we had some LEDs. Some LEDs' uh, batteries were dead, so we then had to have tea lights. We're not tea lights because we didn't have A couple enough. big candles, too. Yeah, it was it was pretty funny. Yes. Maybe we'll post a photo of... Of your insistence on doing the candles, even. but it was cute. wasn't it cool it was, though? It added to well, it. Yeah, it was, it was. It was good. Okay, I'm getting a little. I feel like I'm. You know, I'm getting personally attacked here. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> um, but anyway, I appreciate your enthusiasm. <laughs> but it was fun. That's Both. what makes you a great dad is your enthusiasm. I do like to do. I am enthusiastic. There's no doubt about it. But yeah, so two great games, Ten Candles, um, and I'll mention this as well is that. After we played Ten Candles and I loved it, I ended up picking up a copy of the game, and it was the I got a I ordered a physical copy and then also the PDF, and the PDF was sent literally by the creator, and he was like, "Hey, uh, this is actually a real person, and if you have any questions, feel free to like message me." And so I was like, "Hey, I had a really great time. We played this game for the first time," and he emailed back and he's like, "I'm so glad that you enjoyed it. You know." Just keep in touch, and and you know I'm happy to hear like your stories about your games. I was like, wow, what a cool! That was so cool, you know. Like, I like that. I appreciate yeah. that. You know, that kind of hands-on. I don't know. A lot of these games are done by like normal people, like indie developers. It's not like you're reaching out to the head of Wizards of the Coast or Hasbro or something like for D and D. You're like talking to like people who are literally self-publishing out of their house. You know, a lot of the time with these that, indie that feels games. Feels familiar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> but anyway yeah some great game we played some fate we played the dragon lance game of course which you guys are continuing along through the um the castle amber adaptation Somebody that i've been died. doing 
That's right. The Knight of Salamnia, Abby, oh, died. Abby died. Yeah. yeah. But she got brought back. She got better. She got better. <laughs> <laughs> she died just as we were escaping, too. But you, you, I, you know, I just kind of point this out. You know, we always do Roll for Initiative at the beginning of this, of the show. And, like, you think about, you know, it is possible. Again, guys out there, listeners, it's possible to play games when you have a busy life. You have to make a commitment to it. It means you're tired a lot of the time. Sometimes. Your scheduled game arrives, and you look across the table at your husband or partner, and you just think, or no, you actually say, I don't feel like playing this Oh, my God. I didn't feel like playing Alice is Missing on that Friday night, and we played it. I wasn't going to call us out, but it was good. Like, I'm glad, you know, I went into there exhausted, but I had a great time. I know. So you got to kind of push yourself if you want to do gaming, but it is possible. I mean, listen to all these games we played in just the last two weeks since our last podcast. So, I mean, it's possible and doable. It just takes effort. And um, and so we hope you're out there getting some great games. And uh, feel free, of course, to email us at RPGs and Baby Makes 3 and let us know what you've been playing, what you've been up to, or any great games that you found that maybe we don't know about. We'd love to hear about them because we're always up for trying new things. So yeah. let's get to our first segment. Don't worry. Don't worry. I'm not gonna do what everyone thinks I'm gonna do. Flip out! Look, look, I've got a major problem, okay? Hold up, wait a minute, something ain't right! You have no power over me. Groans and moans. All right, moans and groans. We're going to talk about something here. Like, so I'm springing this a little bit on Gretchen. I told her that we were going to do a talk. We're going to do a, a segment on this, but she wasn't quite sure what I was going to talk about. But I knew that if I brought this up in in topic, that we would have a good conversation. And that's fudging dice. Now, so we talked about cheating before. This is a little different. And we're also going to talk about real dice versus algorithms during this conversation as well, because they're sort of related in some ways. So fudging dice. I think it really relates to DMs, GMs, altering dice rolls to influence what is happening during the game. And I'm going to tell you something right now. I have fudged dice before. Well, I see. We haven't even, you know, gotten into this topic very much. And already I'm like, well, it's your game. (laughs) Like, you're doing it. I know. But so, like, there are certain, there are purists out there who say, Oh, never fudge dice. There are purists out there who don't even play with a GM screen. You know, to each his own. I'm not gonna wait. I'm not gonna yuck your yum, as Amanda often will like to say. But I think that fudging dice is an important and long-standing part of role playing. So, let's say you've created an encounter with your players, and this is gonna be controversial. I know people are gonna agree and disagree with me on this, but. Let's say you've made an encounter for your players and they're getting their butts kicked by whatever you've got going on. Maybe you make a little bit of couple of alterations on some dice rolls so that way they don't get their, they don't all die. That TPK, huh? Well, yeah, so you don't end up with a TPK. Or maybe some big bad or something that's supposed to be super tough. And this is going to be controversial. Maybe it's not quite so tough. And the big climax of some storyline is just really not all that tough. Maybe you want to beef that encounter up a little bit in mid-encounter. Do you know that I do those things? Are you aware? I I think the better question is, do I care? Okay, I know you don't care because you just want to have a fun game. You know, if you... You're a a very kind and giving DM. Uh, We just talked about how... Addy died last session. I know, but I think, you know, at a certain point, you you know, you make sure that we, for the most part, don't die left and right. I think we've been put into a lot of situations where, you know, it's been probably pretty close and you've kind of been like, okay, well, well how, no, how, how, you know, like with the hags. Okay, so did, here. Did you fudge that battle at all? That one hag that almost killed Malachite? No, actually, no? no, I didn't. So here's the thing about the. It, let me let me kind of express a couple of things. Is that I think fudging dice is totally great and fine. 
If you want it, if you need to do it, then I don't have a problem with it. It needs to be smartly used, okay? But I also think that when you become really good at a system, at using a system and understanding a particular game system, like I am with AD&D 2nd Edition, which is probably the thing I know best out of every game, I, I know the rules back and forward, is that it becomes less necessary because I don't generally misunderstand encounters in the way that I would in some other games that I'm less well versed in. So a lot of times I can create a challenge level for you and the characters and the other characters in the game that make it challenging but not overwhelmingly challenging. Now the one thing I did do in that hag fight is I played a little rule of cool in there. So I gave you guys opportunities to succeed that I hadn't perceived. So what I would say is Malachite fell against the hags, if I'm not mistaken. He did, yeah. And that would have broken the spell. That So essentially here's what's happening. There's these hags and they've got this dark ritual to basically make a plague in the name of the god of rot, basically. And they were going to do this big ritual to sort of expand out this plague. And the players could stop it and reconsecrate this temple for this god of healing instead. And they needed to complete it, this ritual, without being disrupted. Oh, no, I'm not talking about that one. That was Atska L who fell during that one. And Tick Tick, you allowed Tick Tick to jump in to take his place. Oh, okay. I'm so talking I about the remember. first hag fight where it almost just murdered all of us, I feel it's like. It's like underground? Yeah. No, I didn't fudge that one at all. Oh, God. We just made it through, yeah. most of us. <laughs> well, so that there are different types of hags in 2nd edition D&D. I don't know about in the other editions, but there are different types of hags, and there are... And this was kind of a more brutish hag. So as hard as it was, it was kind of like you just beat it up until it's dead. It's not really like this particular type of hag. It wasn't... They had some magical powers, but they were more like combat powers, whereas some of the other types of hags are more like magical and can really screw you up, you know? She so, had some wicked claws. Yeah, she had those claws and stuff. But but anyway, the point is, is that is that there are times when I think like, you know, bending the rules or making, you know, making rules favor out one way or the other. It's like, I always fall back on this. The game is meant to be fun. Yeah, you do. Is it more important for me to have the entire party wiped out? Because if there's a TPK, it's over. The game is over. You know, everybody makes new characters, right? Is that more important to me to be like, stringently stick to the rules as written read the dice exactly as they come out when I roll them, or maybe change up one or two dice rolls here or there, very rarely, to ensure that an encounter that I misjudged, I, as the DM, misjudged, I made a mistake on, in order for the characters to survive so the story can continue. Because let me tell you something, I want to know what's going to happen with Tick Tick Brambleving. I want to know what's going to happen with Addie Pennington. I want to know what's going to happen with Melanor Brightgleam. And I want to know what's going to happen with Malachite. I don't want to know what's going to happen with random unmade character yet. You guys I'll have... tell you what's going to happen with Tick Tick. He's going to get a giant hamster. <laughs> it's going to die. Gonna eat all the snow. <laughs> he's a horrible person. Gretchen's Roll 20 name is all of my mounts die. Because <laughs> <laughs> you kill them all. <sighs> but you know what I mean? It's like, it's like, I don't, it, and I, it's such a rare thing. You gotta be very, you gotta be very careful about how you use fudging dice. But at the same time, it's like, characters are still dying. I mean, like, like, Addy died, Malachite's died twice, Tick Tick has been turned to stone, Melanora almost, almost died. died. Opening a book. And she's almost died a couple of times. Adskael is dead and gone. Skamus is dead and gone. Characters die in the game. So it's deadly. And of course, they get, they've gotten brought back to life. But that's part of the game. Is like magic that brings people back to life is a part of Dungeons & Dragons. So like, it's not like I'm fudging dice in a way that is making it so that way that you guys are superheroes or anything like that. True. I mean, it's it's still challenging. So, and I got to use it carefully. And and I think that that's, you know, the, the, the key there. I know some people will disagree with this, but so I... So you're advocating for cheating. I am, I guess. A but, little bit. But see, here's my take. It's your game. 
if you want to up the the difficulty mid attack or mid whatever or lower it I mean, your, your goal is to always make sure it's a fun game, so you're not going to abuse it in a way that is problematic, I feel like. Um, I feel like some people out there, yeah, you know. Yeah, that's the point. Like, I think that's people get bogged down in things that aren't really as important. The most important thing is that everybody is having fun. That is like the most, why are we playing these games? Fun or fulfillment? It's one of those two things. Like sometimes, I mean, I don't know if I would call our recent game of Alice is Missing as fun. It was, but it was incredibly fulfilling. You know, I guess that is fun for me. But like, I mean, like I think of AD and E Second Edition. There's like all these rules on like encumbrance, like weight and carrying stuff and like movement and all that. Like I play that rule very loose because that's not fun. Yeah. Worrying about making sure that when you go out for a, you know a trip. That you have enough food and drink. That's not fun. Like survival. Like all those little... I mean, I just assume that you have enough food and drink. You know? Like we don't talk... I mean, you your character loves food. So we talk about your character loving food a lot. Well, but, I think this also kind of loops into some of what Amanda had talked about in the um, episode where we discussed wheelchairs. You're mm. kind of breaking the fantasy of it like we're not talking about you know having to go to the bathroom or right uh, for us ladies getting our periods or like why are we gonna be like oh shoot i only have one bean and four drops of water i mean if that's the game you're playing and you want to play us it doesn't sound fun to me particularly fun to me but i could i could imagine like a, a bleak survival horror game okay, for yes, a little if bit that is a part of the story yes but yeah. it's like dnd you're out fighting dragons and there's you know like colossus and yeah, like really yeah like, like let's focus on something that is worthwhile yeah, so, I mean, I kind of think all of that sort of gets back to is, like, what are you doing in the game that is making... Is, is everybody at the table having fun? Then who cares? There's no purity of it. You know what I mean? It's not like you don't get extra points because your game is more pure, you know, or something like that. To me, it's... A, the way you win in D&D is everybody has fun. That's winning. That's winning D&D, you know? like That's like any game. Really? Yeah. Which actually. is why we don't play Monopoly. <laughs> Nobody wins Monopoly, Gretchen. <laughs> Nobody wins Monopoly. Someone out there does. God, I freaking hate Monopoly so much. But anyway, it's an interesting topic. <laughs> and um, and real quick, we just kind of want to, as far as fudging dice goes, is you can't fudge when you use an algorithm. No, you can't. Well, it's I don't know. Right what kind of, I feel like this is a little bit squeezed in here. Maybe we should talk about real dice versus algorithms at another time. Okay. Okay. Let's talk about it at the end of the show. We'll come back to it. We'll loop around. We'll loop around. Okay. Let's get into our next segment. Let's do it. Hey. Hey, 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 hey. What's going on? We look at the person through the peephole. You talking to me crazy? Maybe if I get lucky, we get a little action adventure of our own going. You know what I mean? <laughs> Proficiency check. Proficiency check. We want to talk about something that we think is really interesting, and it's something that Gretchen and I just recently found out about, really, and that's lines, veils, and X cards. Now, this is something that is really prevalent, I think, in the online community, but I think it's also really good for in-person games as well, in particular, really, if you're playing with strangers. And so... Let's let's describe what this means here. So, do you so, want to take this one? Or okay. What? So, a line is uh, a line which you do not cross. So, let's say uh, one that comes up a lot that I've noticed is sexual assault. Mm -hmm. A game will not mention sexual assault at all. It does not come up. It that must be respected by all players and the person running the game. And not even alluded to. It is completely outside of the game. If there is a line drawn on sexual assault, sexual assault will not be mentioned in the game. Right. Whatsoever. Period. And that one comes up um, a lot and one in it, you know, that usually comes up before we can even say anything, so we don't even have to ask about that. Um, one that we mention all the time is violence against children. But we don't draw a line on that one. So that's the second part of this, and that's veils. So veils are 
it's something that can be mentioned. It can happen off screen. It can fade to black. It can happen, but it's something that doesn't get described in graphic detail or doesn't happen in the main setting. So like we, like you mentioned, we do not want violence against children as being a feature part of our game. But let's say we're playing a game and we are tracking someone who has hurt children. Right. That would be the extent to which it might be mentioned. Uh, Like, oh, he's known to be a child murderer. Period. That's it. But you're not, like, describing all of that stuff. You're not, like, you know, exactly what he did or how that all worked out. You just move on. You just... And that's, that's the veil. And then finally, an X card is something that you can play in game that says while something is happening like literally something a discussion about a topic or something is happening in game and you can play an x card and this can be in in the digital world there's literally a card that has an x on it and it's it's a virtual card you could play in the middle of the game and the game master and when you're agreeing upon an x card will retcon the game back to before that thing started happening and change the story. So, you know, one thing that I think of with an X card is you've mentioned that you've gone, you were playing in a game at one point where this character just started brutally torturing an NPC. Yes, that's For no right. reason, really. And it was really hard. And that personally upset me. And I don't, I don't like torture. Um, I would say torture is a veil for me. I like in general in games, like I don't want on screen torture. Um, like I think maybe light, like if it was, you know, the kind of thing like in Supernatural, you know, where they're tied to a chair and they get punched. Tell me what you know, you know, that kind of thing. But like real torture, like I don't want any of that in my games. Yeah. And yeah, that made me personally feel uncomfortable. So that would have been an area where I would have thrown down an X card. So lines, veils, and X cards are things, lines and veils are decided before the game. But they can also be added at any time. If a game agrees to lines and veils and X cards, then you discuss them before the game. These A lot of times game masters will say, send them to me privately, what your lines and veils are, and I'll put them out there. And for the most part, we've played in pretty trusting groups, so we just talk about them. Like, it's no issue. We yeah. just sort of talk about them at the beginning of the game. We always mention our our veil of, of violence towards I children. Basically, everyone, on at least at the Discord server that we've been on, we've been lurking on everyone i don't know there's just a vibe that hasn't been it's not a creepy weird vibe yeah at least with the games that we've been playing yeah like so like i almost feel like you wouldn't even need to make those stipulations i don't feel like those people for the most part those wouldn't even come up yeah i i kind of sort of feel like you just never know so i think it's good to get it out there have it out in the Mm -hmm. open so there's no question and i also think when you agree to play a game with that you have to understand that that could come up at some point that someone throws down an x card and you have committed yourself to this game and the rules um were agreed upon before starting so you don't really have room to argue you just okay that's it. This is offending There someone. is no you argument. Just, you just go back and you just do it again. Any lines, veils, or X cards, the, the sort of the etiquette regarding those is you do not argue over what those are. And any anybody has any of those, you, you that is sacred in that way. Now, we hadn't heard about this previous to this, had you? I mean, I've only really heard about this in the last several months and I you know, I know it's a big thing now. Now I kind of notice it everywhere because Yeah. You know, because it's like one of those things like once you see it, it's like all of a sudden you start seeing it everywhere. Yeah, like I understand what some of these posts are, maybe. I don't know. And this is a newer thing. I think I think that when we you know, when we were younger and growing up with gaming, they didn't <laughs> When we were when younger. When we were kids, they didn't have any <laughs> Get off my Get lawn. this X card out of my driveway. Um, <laughs> but we didn't have these things but i actually kind of think that this is pretty good now you probably don't need this for your like home gaming group if we had our like group that we play Dragonlance with over here at our house we know how to read the room and maybe you're playing with people that you know how to read the room but this is kind of better safe than sorry yeah and if you're playing with people you don't know really well that aren't like close friends if you're playing in a tournament circumstance for example you're playing online you're in a discord group you're playing in a in a group maybe you found on roll 20 or fantasy grounds or something i think this is almost like a critical component i know now that i know about it i'm like every game it's not a bad idea because i never really thought about it but yeah that torture scene really did bother me and if there was like if i was playing a game 
and there was no mechanism for me to not allow graphic description of child torture, I wouldn't want to play in that game. And I would feel very uncomfortable. And I'm not like a snowflake. I just have a child and it becomes real for me. I don't want that in my life. Well, I think one of the things that make you such a good GM is the fact that you, your imagination is so vivid. And you can't even, you're not even, I can't even get you to watch horror movies I know, with me unless they're funny. Head. Yeah. But I think that's, I, I don't know. I, I, no, I can't really watch horror movies now. <laughs> I don't, I don't, but I don't mind a bleak story. <laughs> we played Alice is Missing, and that was pretty. That got pretty dark and, and suspenseful and scary too. But like, so it's not like I can't play those. But I think that the, that laying down some of that, I think, is just really. I think it's a really good mechanism, mm -hmm. and you can set expectations too. So like. That doesn't mean that you just have to accept that. If you could also make a game, like let's say you were running a game online, and I've seen people do this, they'll be like, "This game will contains blank blank blank." If you can't handle that, then this game is not the game for you. So I you think can that's set a good way to put it out. right. Yeah. So like, if you're playing a game where I don't know where where the villain does things that are pretty horrible, and without the villain being doing those things that are horrible it doesn't make any sense anymore then it's not a game for people who can't handle those horrible yeah, things don't happening show up to the game and expect the game to change if you've been notified of these things ahead yeah of time. if you've been notified ahead of time so i think that's also the responsibility of the game master to set expectations that certain things are going to exist before people sign up to play it and then those lines and veils have to be respected and the x card has to be respected so I, it's, I think this is something that I'm definitely going to be incorporating into all of my online games. I don't know if the in-person games maybe so much, unless we're trying out some games that are that are have more like mature adult or themes. new people, or if new game. people are around. Yeah. Um, yeah, but I like it. I mean, I think it's a really good resource, and uh, I'm glad it exists. I mean, I think it seems kind of almost long overdue, to be honest with you. Yeah. So um, interesting topics. If you've got some discussions or ideas or thoughts about lines and veils and x cards or other resources that you've heard of that sort of act similarly feel free to email us at rpgs and baby makes three at gmail.com we would love to hear what you have to say about it and uh because we both think it's very interesting give, give us some more emails we, we need like more them emails. we, we like, like them the, you know, you, comments we need tell to us. know you like us yes tell us you like uh, us that you're listening i don't trust view counts or no, listening counts no, it doesn't even matter uh Bag of holding. Hmm. All right, so this is our final segment here, and we wanted to talk about creative blocks because I think this is something that we all kind of experience from time to time, whether we're running games or playing games, and we're trying or to anything keep, in life. Uh, in life, yeah, yeah, creative blocks. I mean, like we're all exhausted parent a lot of us are exhausted parents or just exhausted people although i will admit sometimes exhaustion can bring out some pretty cool creativity well yeah because maybe your brain is too tired to be rigid yeah and also you just don't care you wanted to say something else yeah i know i was gonna say don't give an f but i'm not gonna say that this is a family show yeah you're gonna have to edit out when i drop the b word right? i know <laughs> but you know what a good beep every now and then is it's worth it well i want to choose the sound that gets made there like, wah, wah, like a horn honking or something? Yeah. Maybe. Get creative with it. I will. Unblock that creativity. So anyway, yeah, so we wanted to talk about this and some strategies and things that you can use for creative blocks. And I know a lot of us, you know, we run games and it's like a weekly game or maybe even a bi-weekly game. And it's like, keep the game going. Keep it interesting week after week after week after week after week in perpetuity for years. <laughs> <sighs> I think I'm speaking from my own personal experience here or what? <laughs> and I have ups and downs, but one of the things is I've been really good about is keeping consistent campaigns going for a long time. We're in... Good campaigns. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate I, people that. People still talk about some of your old campaigns. Yeah. And now I have a typical runtime of 70 to 80 sessions for a long-term campaign, like a Dungeons and Dragons campaign. The Supernatural campaign has probably had about 25 to 30 episodes spread out over five years, but that's more episodic, so that's a little bit different than... Monster of the Week. It's a more of a Monster of the Week, although there are ongoing themes. They're mostly Monster of the Week games, so 
There's a lot of things that I do, though, to kind of break that creative block. And probably the biggest thing is I just steal stuff. <laughs> I mean... You are inspired by a multitude of sources. I am inspired by many things, it's true. But I, like, one of the things that always, the best thing for me to get out of creative block is, like, what am I reading in a book right now? What am I watching on television? What movies? What crazy thing did my son do today? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> You know what? Let's just... Today, Lincoln learned crayons work on walls and cabinetry. <laughs> <laughs> and Rob learned how to clean it off. <laughs> so, I mean, a lot of oh. you probably know that, know those, have those skills as well. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, like, okay, let's just take that example. Like, let me just get my gears churning on that. What if you came into a city and the group is there and you got nothing going on? There are these strange markings on the walls oh, throughout the city. They look like scribbles. They they look like scribbles, but there's something more to them. There seems to be an, almost an intelligence behind them. There are no readable language that you can that you're aware of. And then just I mean, like I just came up with that this second, but I didn't come up with that. Lincoln came up with that. There are there's a source of inspiration everywhere. What is that smell? What is that smell? <laughs> Where is that smell coming from? <laughs> and that is a horrible smell. <laughs> Man, that is close. <laughs> or I'm like, okay, so we're sitting in this room right now, and in this room are is a container a of of cat toys, oh, right? Yes. And sitting in front of the cat toys is a <laughs> cat toy that's filled with catnip, and it is a giant carrot. Okay. There's a food vendor that all of their fruits and vegetables are enormous. This year, for the spring harvest, for some reason that they don't even understand, all of their fruits and vegetables grew giants. Why did this happen? Maybe there's other things that have happened, or maybe they've grown giant, but the other nearby farms have grown fallow. Why is that? Hmm. Stories or, are about, gonna... I, I have one. You walk into this room and you're suddenly struck with the, the knowledge that a tornado went through. <laughs> Why is the crap laying everywhere? What happened? What made the crap everywhere? <laughs> There's just a random shoe on the floor. Who does the shoe belong to? Is there a foot still in the shoe? Maybe there's a foot still in the shoe. There's like a severed foot sitting in the shoe, rotting in the corner. What happened there? Like there's stories that everywhere, like if you just look around and and, and that's where I get my inspiration is it's oftentimes, I mean, I guess I'm kind of coming up with my own stories with in relation to all of those things, but there's everywhere around there are stories that you can that you can just grab from. But I would also recommend there are actually some pretty great resources. There's the, oh gosh, I'm, I'm, I'm totally forgetting what the resource is here, but it's like where you can search for like a hundred something. So the group found in the last adventure that I was running for my, my D&D game, the group was in a Hydra's layer and it was like kind of moist, very moist in the in the layer. And there was a- There are people out there shuddering. And I know you did that on purpose. So moist. <laughs> and the um, there was an area that, had been in um, this, this local druid and herbalist had used to grow mushrooms before this hydra moved in. So anyway, one of the characters ended up going in and grabbing a bunch of the mushrooms. So I didn't know what was in there as far as the mushrooms. I didn't lay it all out. And by the way, DMs don't lay it all out beforehand. Who cares? That's so just... What, it's it's so, a lazy so, dungeon master. The lazy dungeon master. What a circumstantial thing. But anyway, I literally looked up Dungeons and Dragons mushrooms chart. And I found a list of a hundred mushroom types randomly. And things that they do. And things that they do. And they have little special, minor special abilities. It was for fifth edition, so I had to alter them slightly to fit into second edition, but just barely. I had the player who found them literally roll five times to decide what the five mushrooms were gonna be. I randomly pulled them off the table and I gave these mushrooms out. Now these mushrooms have interesting powers. Those powers now have a story. They have an interesting little element that maybe 
a character is interested in it. There's little things like that. They're all over. There's these resources or these... Which reminds me of the broom that Melanora now has that she uses all the time. She does use the broom all the time. It's this flying broom. And he, Rob just randomly rolled for, I guess, loot. And yeah, so I randomize loot a lot of the time because I kind of think... I don't... It's not always randomized. But I think that it's fun to randomize loot to see what happens. Now you want to be careful too. You don't want to give characters things that are too powerful. And you want to make sure that characters get some stuff that they can use too. So like, you know, if, you know, you're constantly rolling randomly and, and you're not getting a cool weapon for the fighter in your group, then maybe you need to just alter what that weapon is that you rolled and to, to be something they can use. But it's also basically like but... letting something be creative for you. Yeah. You don't, if you can't figure out what the loot is going to be, we'll find a random loot generator. So, or the, random encounters. The AD&D 2nd Edition Forgotten Realms Adventures hardcover, in the back of it, has a list of gem types. So whenever I roll gems for loot, I randomly roll from the gem generator that's in the back of the Forgotten Realms Adventures book. It describes what the gems are and their value, but some of them have special properties and interesting features, and some of them like can do stuff. And there's spell components and things like that. It just adds like another potential possibility because people might be like, ooh, maybe I could use that or I could do... Or you guys found randomly a random encounter. You ended up finding this big hunk of blue adamantite in a chest, which is a metal. And it was unforged metal. And it was like, it was a random kind of encounter, a random find. And later in the week, I had the player who was the knight in our game bianca who was on our podcast a couple of episodes ago was so excited about it she's like i can't wait to use this and then she ended up sending me some other stuff like a scab or draw she like gets into it like it gets the players into it and then the players are creative for you mm -hmm. you know it's so like you said i love that term you just used you're letting it be creative for you so like you don't even have to do the mental work like the tables do the work for you and yeah. then they can you can just kind of go off on that and again yeah i mentioned the lazy dungeon master what a great way to come up with scenarios and ideas and stuff like that but you have a particularly interesting sort of personal artifact family artifact that is a spark for creativity talk about that so it's this little box that my dad i don't know if he gave it to me or let me borrow it and it's just been you know 20 years since i <laughs> that happens but it's this box of cards that are prompts uh and it was created by brian eno and it's called oblique strategies and each card has just some random little prompt and it is meant to help break a creative block and so that you can you know take whatever these sayings are and kind of go off from them which is really nice so you know there are things out there that exist to help you overcome the blocks and I think you know especially for people who are just really tired and that includes parents or just anyone else who's out there hustling because that's what we got to do working two jobs or you know just in college and also working or whatever yeah, you're don't, doing don't feel intimidated because you don't feel like you can come up with these ideas you can use all of these things that are available to you to come up with these ideas for you, to help you, to aid you. So don't feel like, okay, well, I don't want to do this because it's just going to be too much for me. Well, you know what? There are some cheats for it. So give it a try. See if these cheats work for you. See if like the random encounters deck that you have so many decks. What are, what, <laughs> what are some of the decks that you have? So I have like a wilderness encounters deck. I have a fumbled searches deck which is i haven't even used that yet but i'm cannot wait to start that's, using that's that one effective tape, the <laughs> like. but they're really fun okay um you know i have all these random tables and stuff like that yeah i mean the, the decks are really great because it's like you can combine little features and like so make... like the game before last your dragon lance game we had two random encounters one was we found a burn down sign well, there was really three because you found the adamantine, the adamantine hunk. 
Okay, so there's and, that. And, and then you found the burned out sign, which is still smoldering. Yeah. And then we stumbled upon a family of Ettons. Right, two headed giants basically that were which setting up an ambush. It was so much fun. Everybody enjoyed it. Everybody loved it. So, it was all so random. basically, what happened was Tick Tick knows giant language uh, and he can be invisible and he can do audible glamour. So he went and pretended to be one of the uh, siblings uh, and spoke in giant to the other sibling and incited rage. Basically, incited a family fight. It was a great. A family fist fight. And then the group just quietly snuck by. It was so much fun. <laughs> that, that was, was really so fun. Much it fun. was a really interesting solution to the encounter, but that was all random. Now, I will say the smoldering sign. So it was a, it said a burned out signpost. But I wanted to make it in line with the adventure that you're on. So I made it like it had recently been burned. Mm. Because... Maybe somebody is working against you and they're further along down the path. Mm. So I kind of put that in there. I just sort of snuck that little detail in there. And I like to do that kind of thing too. You know, and one of the things too is that, you know, we think of a creative block as being like a block. It's a place that stops us. But one of the things that's good about a creative block is it means you can get out of a rut. There might be, you might have been stuck in a storyline or doing the same thing over and over again. Usually to break a creative block, you have to do something to break it. You have to do something different. You have to go beyond what you're ordinarily doing. And that is how you grow creativity, mm -hmm. creatively. It's like you have to break the block. So like doing these things, bringing in these other ideas, these tables, the things like oblique strategies, things that help you break out of writer's block, it can actually make you a better writer, a better storyteller, a more creative person. So it's not necessarily something to be afraid of or be feel anxiety about it. Live it. Feel it. Take it all in. Take in the creative plot. Let it happen. Take it in. Moment. But really, yes, exactly. Use it. It's <laughs> it's a part of the process. And I'm, you know, I don't talk about this, but I'm like literally a professional writer. And like oftentimes I'll have an article or something that I'm writing and I'm like, I don't even, what am I going to do? What am I going to do here? What am I going to do? Well, you always start with one thing. What's that? Try to insert a dad joke. If I can insert a dad joke. I do. I actually put a lot of little puns and stuff yeah, in my you writing. Do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, anyway, I, tell us your stories. We, this is a really great topic. This is a topic. Yeah, how do you break your creative block? Yeah. What are things that help you, um, help you mold your adventures? Yeah, what are the resources and that you use and, and send them to us. Let us know because we and we'll ha be happy to share them with the rest of our listeners because I know and I'll take them myself because like I said, I love to steal stuff. So RPGs and babymakes3 at gmail.com. We'd love to hear all about it. Well, we've come to the end of another episode of RPGs and Baby Makes 3. And I don't know why I've decided to start using this accent right here at the end. <laughs> <laughs> uh, as promised, great. though, let's talk about real dice versus algorithms. This is a funny little thing. So if you played online at all, you probably had the opportunity to use algorithms for rolling dice. Dice rolling programs... And a lot of times, like, we kind of have to use them or you're sort of, like, rolling and nobody can see you roll and there's some issues there with certain people. I hate algorithms and so I use them all the time. Huh? I hate rolling with algorithms. I would much prefer to roll dice. But when I play online, I almost always use algorithms because I hate them. I'm so counter. Is that you married me? <laughs> <laughs> no, that's horrible. I know. <laughs> you drive me crazy, so I married you and decided to have a baby with you. Let's stick together forever. <laughs> <laughs> I must be miserable. <laughs> no, but what I so like the algorithms. So okay, I'll give you an example. I was playing in a AD and D second edition game. This really fun Krakenheim game. It's set in the. The, the North and Greyhawk and we're ice barbarians and all this. And so we get to this orrery, which is a 
Orrery. Orrery. I think that's how you pronounce it. I don't know. I just want to make fun of it right It's now. one of those, Orrery. it's like um, a room where there's all the planets and they're rotating around the sun and like you can rotate them and they all move. It's like a big... Orrery. Orrery. <laughs> I think it's called an Orrery. <laughs> Um, anyway, whatever the freaking call, whatever it's freaking called, it was there and we were trying to get in and there's these evil dwarves and they weren't letting us get in. So they were using these giant planetary balls to like smash into us, right? So like, oh God, this is going to sound like such whiny dice stuff, whiny roll stuff. So I roll to go, you have to roll low in D&D to make checks for stuff like for, for for ability checks and stuff so i make the first like four in a row and i roll super low so like i'm you know it's a d20 so i'm on like three five two one you know awesome rolls and then i get to the last one and i proceed to roll like 20 15 18 17 so first it rolls all these super low rolls all in a row and then it rolls all these super high rolls all in a row now that can happen with real dice, but I think it's a conspiracy. <laughs> computers I mean, do hate you. Do you? You don't really roll on computers ever, though, do you? I mean, I even with our online, online games, games, like we, when we were playing Fan of Star, I was using because they had that nice dice generator which built it, which I thought was pretty fair. I thought it rolled very well. The Fate Dice um, Roller, yeah. You know, we've used it for Troika. We've used it for Junior Braves. We use it all the time when we're playing Discord. But when we played Supernatural again recently, I just, I don't know, I just had to pull out the dice. Uh, just, I don't know. Classic, right? But I mean, like, also the thing about is that the regular dice can be flawed. We talked about that before. Flawed or lucky? Lucky. They can be lucky. They can be off or weighted funny or whatever. And they can roll weird, like randomly rolling more certain numbers than other numbers. So, like... That's kind of the algorithm. Nothing is a perfect random number generator. You're not getting it. I mean, maybe it's possible to make some sort of, I don't know, maybe the metal dice are more likely to be perfectly balanced. I have some metal dice that are like that, really clear cut metal dice. Maybe those are. We should talk to a diceologist. Yeah, we need to talk to a diceologist. You know what? This is not a great topic. I think we should move on. <laughs> it sounds so whiny. <laughs> What do you people you, think? You made it whiny. Where you're like, it was nice, wasn't rolling well. <laughs> what do you think out there? Are we just whiny? We L am I. You am should speak for yourself. Is God. Gretchen really whiny and annoying? <laughs> <laughs> is that why I married her? <laughs> oh, oh man, no. I really I hope wish. You like the couch? Oh gosh, I don't know. I might have gone in a bad direction here at the end of this episode. <laughs> Thank you for listening in. We really appreciate it. We've got some really great episodes come up coming. We've got the we're almost done with the food episode and ready for that. And we're gonna do an episode about addition wars with the D and D. Oh, <gasps> dun dun and dragons. Yeah, that kind of works. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but thanks for tuning in, and we appreciate you. And if you listen this long, you you win. You win. You won. I don't know what you. You win. won podcast of today. You won podcast. Congratulations. You did good. We're proud of you. <laughs> That's enough. We'll talk to you next. We'll talk to you in a couple of weeks. Thanks for tuning in. Take care. Bye-bye. <laughs> RPGs and Baby Makes 3 is a production of Gretchen and Rob sitting on their couch. Email the show at rpgsandbabymakes3 at gmail.com. You can find more episodes on Podbean, Spotify, and iTunes as well as on our free Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash RPGs and Baby Makes 3.